It's a pleasure to be here today and talk to you about science, technology, engineering, and math. Fields that we all know are important, fields that we all are interested in, fields that we all have passion for. But it's not enough. See, we're on this beautiful planet right now, and we've just reached 7 billion people. And with 7 billion people, we have to figure out ways to keep clean water, to provide ways to feed all of these people, to provide ways to alert them, protect them, make them aware of what's coming when tectonic events are either approaching or, or we are starting to detect them, or in the aftermath of the earthquakes that come too quickly for us to, to let them know about. We have to provide them with resources. And when we go to find these resources, we hope that in the future we can leave a smaller imprint. We have to find ways to power for 7 billion people. We have to find ways to keep the disease at a minimum so that they can have a healthy life. So this can all seem quite overwhelming. Or we can step back, step back to a place like here in Houston, and think about where we began, what our stories are, what our conversations in science, technology, engineering, and math are. So this is where I would like to start today, is how to start that conversation, how to engage and make sure that STEM isn't just for the scientists, it isn't just for the engineers and the folks in technology and in math. It's for all of us, because with a community of 7 billion people, we all, at least, at the very least, have to be able to speak the language, have to understand the concepts. And at the most, we want more people out here in the audience working with us, solving these problems, and going on into the future. So as a former high school teacher, I think about how I tried to engage my own students. And as a mom of a four and a half year old, I watch her and I talk to her about things. And that's what I want you guys to see yourselves doing today. That we can strike up the conversations, that we can engage these future generations. So how do we do it? Well, we take something that we're very passionate about ourselves, something that we know well, and all of you will have your expertise. So today I'm going to talk to you about, right now, my conversation is about the International Space Station, about this amazing lab that's 200 miles above us, and how we can use that to engage the very young to lifelong learners like myself. Well, first of all, they're going to notice that this place is not just like any place on Earth. It's a lab where we have to know how to, where we do live, where we work every day, where we're going to eat and sleep and do all these things. So right away, kids and, all, and folks of all ages are very interested in this place where people can be on all levels, ceiling, floor, sides of walls. But you don't want to intimidate them right away that it's so different in this lab. So you, especially for the youngsters, need to make this observation or connection that in space, it's a little bit like where you live, but here's the, the part that's different, or here's the observation that you can make that's different. So just like in their house, we have a place where we live. It's a little bit smaller, and we can sleep on the walls. And of course, all of them are eventually interested in, well, how do you do the basic things that I have to do in my house to get ready for school or to get ready to go to work? Well, it can be a little bit trickier in space, and sometimes it doesn't always meet everyone's uh, cleanliness <laughs> standards, but uh, it, it's very doable. And now they're starting to make those observations that, okay, yeah, I have to problem solve for, for how I would, what would I would do with this free water as I'm washing my hair, or, or where, do the, where do the shavings go when people are shaving their face? We need to talk to them about how not only is it important here on Earth for us to keep ourselves healthy, but how it's absolutely necessary to work out in space. And how over the 10 years plus that we've been on the International Space Station, our exercise equipment has improved and needed to improve so that astronauts would come back with uh, the bone density and the muscles they needed to return to regular life. And it's important for us to talk about how these machines look like the equipment they use here on Earth, but how we had to design them differently to make them work in space. 
everyone loves eating, and it's a great place to start a conversation with people of all ages. So what does eating look like in space? Well, it can be a little like Mary Poppins. And then now we can go into, after we've made the observation that eating, of course, does take place. It's a little bit different. There's not the same plates, but yes, we can use silverware, even chopsticks. Well, then we need to talk about with the older students how we got the food there. How do we preserve the food? How do we make the right nutri nutrients for the bodies of the astronauts that are in space? And how do we just enjoy the central cultural event of enjoying sushi for the first time in space? Remember, there's always the ooh-ah factor of space. And that's going to lead everyone in right away. So of course, this is a, an awesome photo of a water droplet. But then we can go on and talk about the chemistry of water and why it works this way, and the physics of taking this photo in space. Here's another great ooh-ah moment for all audiences. Uh, Naoko brought cherry blossoms when we were up in space, and it's just absolutely beautiful. But again, we can now go from the ooh-ah moment into leading into a conversation about Newton's laws of physics and what really happens when you have an action and a reaction. The great thing about the International Space Station, it has many windows that lead us into a place where we can observe our Earth. And sometimes all of us need to take a step back and remember just how beautiful that place is. And then as we're making the observations of this beautiful place that we live on, we can talk about the extremes that we have to make our vehicles sustain when they go around the Earth as fast as they do and they see sunrises and sunsets and they have the 45 minutes of intense daylight and 45 minutes of cold. And then, I, like I said, don't forget to take the moment to appreciate the sheer beauty of coming across Florida and the going over into the, the Gulf there. We get a moment also to to see time when we've made all these observations over these periods of greater than 10 years, where we have to talk about the deforestation that we're seeing in the rainforest and how important these forests are to us in solving those problems I talked about earlier. Or how we are able to capture the glacier and the, free, the fresh water sources that we have and how we know that they are decreasing in size, but ways that we can protect them and still provide clean water for the future. We need to show the contrast and the extremes that people are living in, where you have water at the very top, but so close you have extreme desert. We have to talk about the size of storms that can affect us and see the true awe and power of them. And then we have to talk about the ways that we can observe the same things that we see on Earth, but how it, it's captured just a little bit differently because of not having atmosphere to look through or getting to look through just a little bit of a sliver of an atmosphere. And again, here's the ooh-ah of the aurora, but then we need to talk about what that radiation means to astronauts that are living in a space station and what it means back here, back on Earth, when we have to provide those power systems that can sometimes be hit by a solar storm. Well, later this afternoon, I'm going to let Dr. Julie Robinson really talk to you about the science that we're able to do on the International Space Station. But I just want to remind you that we can do everything from the alpha magnetic spectrometer to studying our own human bodies as Mike Fossum is doing here with an ultrasound unit. So again, you can reach the very young to those that are in postgraduate. We can talk about ourselves, but we can also talk about other things that have gone to space with us, such as butterflies and spiders and how it's, it's changed the way we see them. And then what I really like to talk about with especially high school and college students is how this is a whole system and it is a complex team and you guys are part of that team. Um, but when you go to do spacewalks and send two people out for six and a half to seven and a half hour time, what it really takes to do all of that. How the spacesuit itself is like a miniature uh, space vehicle and how it's keeping the astronauts safe how it's keeping them cooled, how it's providing oxygen and scrubbing carbon dioxide. 
And most of our, our spacewalks today involve robotics and how that teamwork comes together. And the great thing now is that so many schools have clubs with robotics and kids are starting to engage in that. So now they can see real robotics working in space. And you can talk to them about the different spacewalks maybe that you've worked on or been a team of or that you know about. I, of course, like to talk about the one from STS-131 where we replaced an ammonia tank. And that ammonia tank was going to be used for cooling the space station. And now I get to talk to them about, well, why do we use the ammonia out there? And what are we cooling on the outside of the International Space Station? And why would this later become important when we had a pump module failure? And as we all know, there are those moments where in real time we've had to solve problems, and we've done a very good job of doing that. So you can take the different, for instance, the pump module, or in this case on STS-120, when we had to fix the solar array, and in a short amount of time, we had to take the very complex systems of the space, space suit, the robotic arms, and in a very simple way, fix with these cufflinks a very complex solar array that we needed for power. So I hope what you're seeing is that, again, STEM education can take us from the young to the old, to all of us that are lifelong learners, and help us appreciate and, and hook us in to this uh, story of why it's important and be engaged in science, technology, engineering, and math, and be excited about it. But don't forget, Science is fun. And that's the part that we really need to communicate. Because oftentimes, that's what shuts the students down, and they, and they stop engaging. They don't see it as their career field. But we've got to continue to increase their vocabulary, their awareness, and their appreciation. So I just want to remind you that this isn't just the astronauts going out and speaking. This is all of us. This is all of us that have chosen science, technology, engineering, and math as our future. This is all of us talking about our story and engaging in a very real way with students. Because as a former public school teacher, I know that I couldn't do it alone. I needed the support of all of you. And so I hope today you will leave thinking about your stories, your expertise, and go out there so that 7 billion people more have a really bright future. Thanks. <laughs>